Hello and welcome to this um, individual artist talk from MAST with artist Persephone Ringenberg. Um, my name is Heidi Swevens and I am the Director of Community Partnerships at Inclusive Arts Vermont. For access purposes, I will do a visual description. I have blue eyes and pale skin with short brown hair and today I am wearing a green turtleneck and a tan patterned wool sweater. Behind me are angles and um, lights from the ceiling from the angle of my iPad. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm, I'm really, really thrilled to be here tonight with Persephone. Um, and uh, we've had, MAST has been touring the state since January of 2022. Um, it is currently at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center in New Hampshire, and it'll come back to the Burlington area and wind down at the State House um, in April of 2023. You can find more information about that on our website. Um, features 22 Vermont artists with disabilities and um, a lot of accessibility features. Uh, and tonight we're here with uh, Persephone Ringenberg. And I want to uh, invite you to introduce yourself, Persephone. Hi, my name is Persephone. I use she, her, they, them pronouns. Um, description um, long hair, pull back in a ponytail, um, glasses, blue glasses um t-shirt on and it looks like I've got antennas coming out of my head but it's really a lamp <laughs> Great. and candles flickering around me thanks Persephone um so we're going to start this conversation on um, the way we start I think all of the artist talks so I hesitate, hesitate to say all in this case there's one that's not but um, with the art that's in masked. Um, and we have with us Megan Bent behind the scenes with tech and description support. So um, Megan's going to screen share now and do a verbal description of the piece in masked, which is titled Panic. On the screen, we have a vertical painting. It's filled with lots of movement from brush strokes. Um, and you can see different textures of paint. The brush strokes are in many different colors. There are reds and purples and yellows and greens, turquoise. And there are areas where the colors also blend together. Um, and Persephone, is there anything else that you would like to add? There's also glitter in there. <laughs> Perfect, yes. Great. Glitter and Wonderful. So um, tell us a little bit about this piece, Persephone, if you would. And thanks for the description, Megan. Beautiful. Oh, well, it's kind of funny. Um, I did it when they put into place the and said stock up on things. Mm -hmm. um, things might not be available like toilet paper, food, everything. My mom was just like, oh, people are making a big deal. This virus is like gonna shut down. It's gonna pass. Mm. We're now three years into it. Uh -huh. <laughs> My mom was like, when the lockdown actually happened was just like, guess you're right. I was wrong. <laughs> mm. So this is how I was feeling. I just painted everything I was feeling of just like of hearing wear mask it's coming over it's spreading mm -hmm. and trying to convey that to my mother and she's just not listening to me yeah so I'm laughing. It, it, it's kind of funny because her my aunt is auto, has a immune dis um disease autoimmune disease and that's that just happened within they just diagnosed her with that and so now we're taking those precautions that my mom was not taking those precautions and she also has immune compromised issues so it's just like yeah. i was the voice so yeah, my thought process was the sky is falling, the sky is falling. 
Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and Megan, if you want to stop screen sharing, that would be okay. Um, you know, I, you know, you say, sorry for laughing or you're laughing. I think sometimes uh, emotions come all at once, you know, and, and that's just part of being human. And, you know, this was March of 2020. Is that when, when panic was created? Yeah, it, it should say on the back of the, of the painting. Cause that yeah. was one of the first ones that I had titled and put the date mm -hmm. on. Yeah. And, um, you know, so that, I think sometimes time gives us retrospect and even though the experience has lots of different ways of being around it, you know, you can sort of chuckle at it and like, yeah, I was feeling it and here it is. And I, um, I'm curious if you want to share more about how it got its title, it might be obvious, but if there's anything more to say about panic and, um, it, it was because like, it, it was like, there, it was, we were being told to sort of panic. And so it was just, that's how it came out is yeah because the world was then being told to panic hmm. um you also mentioned that there's glitter in there so if curious if you want to say more about that um detail it, it, either in what it looks like to you or what it felt like to you or kind of I don't, in all of this I, panic why glitter <laughs> i don't <laughs> know i just felt like putting i was doing mixed medium um and it was, I think, body gel that I just smeared on there. And that's why I, I was like, I feel like this needs this on here. This is how I feel. And it, it's, I feel like different people do journaling in a different way. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was like one of my first journal entries doing painting. Yeah, yeah. Even though I've done painting for a while, but in different forms, um, that was just like, I'm gonna date this, title it, put it away. Mm -hmm. And then when you guys um, titled the exhibition for mask, I was like, I know what I'm going to put in there. <laughs> yeah. So you said a couple of things that um, I just want to follow up on. And again, there's not a right or a wrong. Um, and asking you with words. And here you are talking about journaling with painting, right? This decision to create with visual imagery and then sign it and date it. So, um, you know, because you have a mixed media, multimedia. So, the question I want to ask and just explore a little bit more is when did you first start making art? And um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about which mediums you use, oh. what part you engage. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Again, no right or wrong. <laughs> I've been doing art in some form or another for years. Um, middle school, I did photography um, and I can't remember what year it was. It must have been 2004 or 2005. I experimented. I was doing arts and computers in Montpelier. Mm -hmm. um, I also, in high school, when I went to U32, um, was taking art classes there. Um, wasn't that good, but I had a one of the teachers that um, like would help me, like I would just draw things, like I wouldn't do mess, I would do some of their, um, some of their assignments, but like I would go off and like, I'd be able to draw like the fire alarm and I feel like better detail than I could do other things that they were asking us to do. Um, at one point, they helped me draw a picture of a horse because um, I was doing horseback riding mm. or therapeutic horseback riding. Um, but going back to the uh, painting, um, I sold um, my first painting I ever sold was the one that I did because um, I did numerous of them, um, but I had to only pick one 
that was displayed at the uh, state house and it was mm. sold and it was called imagine mm. and it was all abstract and yeah. i think it was i think it was oils i can't remember oils or acrylics mm. but i kicked myself in the butt because i wish i would have taken those paintings that i left there saying oh I'll get them next year i should have oh hi kitty <laughs> He was oh. back. okay. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> you turned into the cat, like the judge. <laughs> you were talking about the the paintings, and yeah, uh, I I really wish I would have kept those and put them into um, a portfolio because mm -hmm. I think those could have possibly sold. Yeah. What other kinds of mediums do you use? So you have the painting and the mixed media. And with uh mm -hmm. photography and uh -huh. so like i take i feel like i take more photos now like during the summer i take photos of flowers and stuff and stuff like that like um my past this past trip when i went to florida i took some photos of um of our trip there um mm -hmm. And those are up on my social media. So like some people might not think that that's very photography or stuff like that. But for me, it's just, again, that's my journaling. So it's how I'm showing myself. And then there's the photos of the dogs. Notorious for taking pictures of dogs. I, they're <laughs> easier to take pictures of than humans. And I take wonderful pictures of dogs. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like maybe you have a, a love of dogs. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> I do. The and the dogs love me back. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the ones over at the dog park. Yeah, I'm curious, like, um, in other artists' stories, there was um, animals who seemed to be posing. Do you have any stories of, you know, photographing dogs that you might want to share? You, you don't have to, I'm just curious. because. Um, well, one person... Uh, uh, another owner took a photo of me with their dog and both of us are smiling and like I would totally steal their dog because I love their dog so much. <laughs> it's a mini Aussie doodle and I was sad, like I would totally like be like I would take that dog like if it's a miniature dog I'll take it and have my dog as well but yeah I'll take you. <laughs> <laughs> You're my dog. <laughs> Well, um, you're talking about photography, and I think it might be um, a good time to show a photograph that you had in the exhibition before Mast, which is called A New. Um, so, Megan, if you would screen share this photograph um, and describe it, and then uh, Persephone will ask you to add anything and tell a story. On the screen, we have a square photograph. It is an outdoor photo from a carnival. Not the carnival, fair. Sorry, from a fair. And there are many structures for trapeze artists. Um, and the structures are held up with ropes that have lots of yellow and white and orange triangular flags on them. The sun is setting, so the flags are illuminated by the setting sun. And on the right hand side of the image are two trapeze artists in silhouette reaching out for their trapezes. And then on the left hand side is one trapeze artist in silhouette who is swinging through the air. And then on the ground, you can, there's a um, large tent in the background that is striped with yellow and blue and red. And did I miss anything else, Persephone? No. Uh, Lights. And That's about it. Yeah, Persephone, would you tell us a little bit about how you took this picture? Or what's the sort of setting, the scene, the moment? Um, it was the right place at the right time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I took a couple of shots and 
um, it was, I think it was like your first, first ex exhibition you guys were doing, or at least the first one I heard of. Yeah, I think it was the first one for you. It's, it, we've done four now, so, um, but yeah, so it was the first one you, it's how you met us, <laughs> how yeah. we met you, yeah. Um, I, it was between this and um, I was also thinking of entering actually a photo that I had taken um, of from my sister's wedding, but I was advised not to. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, but okay. Yeah, and you just mentioned your sister, which reminds me that um, before we started recording, Megan, if you um, want to stop screen sharing, that would be um, We were talking about this photograph because you and I met when you dropped it off at the inclusive yeah. office. Yeah. Um, and can you tell the audience where this photograph is now and maybe a little bit more about it? Oh, yeah. So this photo, my aunt um, saw it at the, um, at Dartmouth and we didn't know that she liked it, but we were, we were like, I was, um, I was thinking, let's just give it to Anna and Uncle Fred, her, my mom's sister and my mom's brother-in-law. Um, and come to find out, and it's taken us a while to finally give it to him. And come to find out that my aunt had actually liked the photo. <laughs> she just didn't <laughs> buy it. So he just surprised her with it. Like I've given her a couple of photos. Like one was of her chickens. Mm -hmm. When nice. they had chickens. So you, you gave her the photo without knowing that it was one of the ones that she had liked. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. Awesome. Um, so you had mentioned also, Persephone, that you the first painting you sold was at the State House. Um, was that yeah. was connected through some high school art? Well, was... no, it was through. It wasn't through high school. Um, it, it was something. It was a program that was going on like once a week. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know who who it was doing. I think it was like sort of a state sort of thing, but it was happening in Montpelier. Gotcha. I guess uh, that was um, less relevant than the question I want to ask, which I don't think was on the, the one ahead of time. It's a spontaneous one, but what is it like for you to have your art shown in, in exhibitions? And, you know, what is that like for you as an artist? Good, but I feel sad when like nothing gets sold. Mm -hmm. Like it's sort of like, should I continue doing it? Like um, I also had stuff shown um, a couple of times in the art hop and like nothing sold mm -hmm. and that has been like my like one time was my photography and then another time was um painting yeah you know so that's like, other artists are, yeah frustrating that other artists um thank you for being honest about that you know it's like it's exciting and that disappointing yeah um some of the other artists were talking about that um, in the, the panel that we just recorded about, you know, things haven't sold. And I think part of the current um, economic context is influencing everything. Um, and I'm not saying that to take away any of your feelings of disappointment or sadness, but, um, you know, artists create to create. And, and then, you know, part of what some of the artists are saying, and I'm curious what you think about this, it's like, it's nice to create, it's important to create, and it's nice to share. And those are kind of two yeah. different parts of the artist artist journey as but I would never a, want it, but I would never want to date an artist <laughs> we're too <laughs> condescending we 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 just break each other down we're, and you're too much of um like Kim competition and criticism uh, of your work's not good enough my work's better like Oh, the, yeah, you're imagining there would, or you're thinking there would be some sort of um, competition or race or who sells more or that sort of thing. No, like, just like your work's not, like, because I've, I've sort of dated an artist before in college and that was not a healthy relationship, but it was just like, they were just like, my stuff was, my stuff was better than yours. 
So it's mm. sort of like that mentality of entitlement mm. and thinking that their work is better and your work is not as good as theirs. And mm. I think that, well, maybe there are some nice artists out there that would be um, good people that would be supportive. I've yet to meet them, but it's just, mm. I, I think it's just how artists are that we're very much about our art and very, my art is good. My art is better. Mm. I, well, I, I, I might disagree a little bit about, and not to challenge, just I think that that artists are like all kinds of people that they're different. You know, you've met one artist and you've met one artist, they're so unique. And it sounds like you had an experience that was impactful for you. Yeah. Um, and the the part that um, I'm wondering about or at sort of touching my heart is this sense of, you know, we're so told by the world that, you know, you have to be higher, faster, better, best in that lens of kind of a hierarchy um, sort of is not the only lens to look through, but artists are so trying, not artists, many artists, creative people, you know, find value in what they do in a world that doesn't always say, oh, look, this is beautiful art. This is really meaningful. This is really valuable. And then um, I'm gonna pause there and see if that resonates at all for you. Yeah, but I still like hear like the sort of like criticism, like this is what you could do differently and not like I've asked, I asked somebody once um, to help me with a camera and they were just like, mind, mind you, they were at their work, <laughs> they, um, the, they work at the bubble <laughs> piece place, but they pawned me off onto um, one of their, um, one of their people that comes in and gets stuff um, to eat quite often. And the person just like was so fast and like, I had no idea what the heck they were saying, like that I couldn't follow them. Like, so I haven't used the camera. Um, and so one of the other things I'm wondering about in terms of like, bigger, faster, good, better, best is how, at least for me, sometimes I think about that with disability and like disability identity and for something, I'm curious if there's any um, link or parallel for you with that. The higher, the hierarchy, um, like I'm on the CDCI and I don't feel like I necessarily fit in with the people on that board, on the, the people with disabilities on that board. Um, I often get very annoyed and want to bang my head um, because I feel this is probably going to bite me in the butt, but I feel uh, there's like only one person I feel that I'm like closely like on the same wavelength with. Um, and yeah, it's, it's very hard to be like from going from somebody that was functioning when they were 15 at a five-year-old to, I don't know what I'm functioning at now, but not at that level. And probably if I was diagnosed now, I would be diagnosed as Asperger's, but I don't like think that like I'm more entitled or that I'm smarter than other, other people even though some people might say because I say some stuff that I am, but like, I don't think, like, I don't have like that high IQ and like I've had like in, interactions with people who have um, Asperger's and they're like, I'm smarter than you. I, I'm gonna get a better job. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. I know better than you. It's just like, okay. Yeah. And I mean, thank you, um, Persephone, for sort of articulating that. And again, if I misunderstood or if I say this in a way that doesn't resonate, but 
there's hierarchies everywhere in our world. So whether that's right. how good is your art or how smart are you or how fast can you go? Like we just, there, uh, there's parts of the world that I think are outside of that or can be um, authentic connection. But sometimes when there's a lot of history of, um, at least for me, I know I've tried to prove myself and um, I've kind of, I'm trying to let go of that because, you know, having a disability, there's a lot of places in the world where um, I'm dismissed or, you know, yeah. So um, I can relate to that sort of wanting to prove myself and um, and also the sort of sense of like, um, there's even categories within communities about things that we label and then we assign value to. Is that? That's why I like music so much. Um, like mm -hmm. I feel like I connect can connect with certain music and I can just put that on and be okay and like listen to it while I do art and mm -hmm. that was one of my next questions like what inspires you it sounds like music is one of those things that inspires music you. and just like whatever like I haven't been inspired um for a while since I got my furry companion mm -hmm. um, I can't I can't trust her to be alone uh -huh. so your furry companion we have another photograph of you at the St. Johnsbury Athenaeum artist um, reception and I believe your furry friend is in that um, yeah. maybe we can share that now and you can tell us you know Megan will describe and you can tell us anything else you she's like a lot more furry now she's a lot more fluffy she got um, groomed and brushed out mm. This is Megan. <clears throat> On the screen is a vertical photograph. It is from an opening reception. Um, Heidi, I believe you said it was at the St. John's Berry Athenaeum. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. And mm -hmm. um, it is Persephone standing with their dog. Um, your dog's name is Willow? Yep, Willow. Willow. Willow is sort of like light gray and tan dog with some wiry fluffy fur and is wearing a red vest. Um, and next to Persephone and Willow is Persephone's painting, Panic. And the wall behind them is yellow. And to the left and right of Persephone are some other artworks from the exhibition. Great. Anything else, Persephone, besides um, that she's Willow is differently Willow groomed? Willow is a labradoodle. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, Megan. Yes, we're talking about you. <laughs> and you have music going, so you, you get inspired by music. Any other things, um, topics, content, you know, dogs, it sounds like. I love taking photos of sunsets. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had, like, some artists talk about a kind of a happy accident, I'm putting that in air quotes with my hands up, um, but like something that you weren't intending to do in the creative process and you were like, oops, I really kind of like this, <laughs> it's actually cool. I'd ha I think one of my paintings mm -hmm. that came out was a happy accident. It was just like I started it as one thing and it, it didn't turn out what I wanted it to be. So, it, or a couple of them have. Yeah. Like one turned out to be an owl and one turned out to just be like an explosion. Yeah, it sounds like you have some um, abstract art in your repertoire. Yeah, that's what I like to do is more abstract. Uh-huh. With uh, adding in glitter on occasion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, we're winding down our time. And um, I heard you say that since you've got Willow, you haven't had as much time and space to create in the same way. Is there anything that you're working on um, or any way people can stay in touch with you? I think you have an um, answer. I mainly take photos. I'm always down to take dog photos. I love, <laughs> love dogs. 
Um, they can follow me on Instagram. And what, what's the Instagram handle? And, and Megan, when we go live, we'll make sure that gets posted. I say this, Megan, but it's just because I know your skill set. I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just so grateful for your teamwork. <laughs> but what's uh, the world through my eyes? And uh, you have dogs on there. What other kinds of things are on the Instagram? Um, it's all sorts of different things. It's um, got some photos from the fair, um, flowers, campfire, um, representing the anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. Mm -hmm. Picture with chicken. Some, and my dog even has her own face. Instagram page too, if you want to follow her. <laughs> and what's that um, handle? Is it even a um, handle? <laughs> Address? Willow, Willow Psychus. All right. Persephone, thank you so much for sharing your time, your, your ideas, your creativity, and, and these um, art pieces. Is there anything else you want to share with the audience before we say bye for now? No. Have a wonderful night. Hi everyone and welcome. We are here for our masked artist panel. I'm Kat and I'm here with my colleague Heidi and we are here with four of the artists from the masked exhibit. They are featuring their artwork in the exhibit masked which is traveling around the state. We won't get too into that because we'll go live but um, Heidi, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm well, I'm really, really grateful to be here with you and with the artists today. Yeah, excellent, excellent. I'm gonna do a really quick verbal description of myself for this practice. It's an access practice we do in all of our digital spaces and all of our spaces. Um, I am Kat, I am a fat, femme, platinum blonde woman. I have my hair pulled up with a scarf tied around my head that's like a peach leopard print scarf. Um, I have bangs and I have rect or, excuse me, triangular metallic earrings, an oatmeal sweater, a gray tank top, and I'm in my sunroom. So there are windows letting kind of a gray sunshine in and there's some furniture behind me. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm so happy to be joined by my colleague Heidi and we'll be facilitating the conversation today. Heidi, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes. Um, so as Kat said, I'm Heidi Swevens. I use she, they pronouns and for access purposes, a visual description. I have blue eyes and pale skin with short brown hair. And today I'm wearing a teal sweater um, with circle earrings that have trees on them. And behind me are angles and shadows and lights. Um, I think there might be a doorway visible. Um, my iPad is angled, so you're the background shows that. Um, I'm the Director of Community Partnerships at Inclusive Arts Vermont, and I get to work on our exhibitions um, throughout the state and with the artists, and so really, really grateful to be here today. Um, and Kat, I think before we introduce the artists and the art, maybe just for the audience, we're going to um, show the works of art from MAST, and then we're going to start some questions um, with the artists and then see where it takes us, because uh, we have the questions as starting places, but really <laughs> part of our hope is that the artists will um, be able to interact with each other and have some of that synergy from just being in the shared space um, digital uh, today. So how's yeah. that sound? That's wonderful. And um, we are also joined, uh, there are the four artists on screen, but we are also joined by our colleague Megan, who's behind the scenes running mm -hmm. tech. So before we get into it with the artists, let's start there. Megan, can you share the artist's artwork? And I know some of our artists are going to do their own verbal description, and then we'll get into you all introducing yourselves. So we'll show the artwork, and then we'll get into your introductions and getting into those questions. So Megan, go for it. And so this is Paul Betts's piece. It's a photograph and it is a photograph of a forest scene. It is called Mossy Crevice and it is on a kind of a slanted forest floor. There is a large rock face that is covered with multiple different kinds of moss. There are dark, dark, green hunter green moss that are kind of um, almost furry and soft and then there is this bright electric green growth coming out of that moss at the bottom left of the rock there is an opening a vertical opening um, that leads to unknown and it's a it's a black space created by darkness and shadow above the rock the um 
the forest floor goes up like it's going up a hill and there are small trees and branches and growth um, all in a mixture of browns and greens on that. So that is Paul's piece. Paul, anything that I missed for that or did I do okay? Oh, thank you, friend. I appreciate you. <laughs> all right, let's see the next piece. Dominic, do you want to describe it or would you like me to? Um, you could, if you wanted to, I could add anything if, if it felt Perfect. it was missing. Perfect. Thanks, Dominic. So this is Dominic Love's piece. Uh, and this is, um, it is a piece, it's a large piece on a square back, black background, excuse me, that's painted black. Um, there are dozens of masks painted all different shades and colors and textures. Um, the masks are paper mache and they have these open vacant eyes that show the black in the background. The masks go in a somewhat circular fashion and there are two different sizes of masks, kind of an adult face mask and then a smaller child's face mask. The masks are painted, the primary colors of them are um, a pale blue, a cobalt blue, grays, sage greens, light oranges, golds, and chromes. And so those are all different. Um, several of the masks have an overall wash with some highlights of those colors. And then there are a few that have these kind of bolder strokes of cobalt blue, one covering about half the face, one bisecting the face, and one with large brush strokes across the face. Anything I missed for you, Dominic? No, I don't think so. Okay, great. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, yeah, go ahead, David. I can do a favor. So this is uh, my piece. It's called Wandering Eyes. Um, it is all in black and white, like an old film. In the middle, bottom middle of it is three uh, women in different dance-like positions. They're dressed in very old-fashioned, like pilgrim is time. Uh, and then the background is the forest. In the background, there's like a Pass going through with uh, trees on each side, and then around it is in a half arc all these different faces that are in a way interacting with the dancers and their own emotions that they show. And um, that is wandering eyes. Thanks so much, David. Great. And this is Kate's piece. And Kate, will you unmute yourself for me? Mm -hmm. Perfect. And Kate, would you like me to describe this, or would you like to describe this? I think I'd like to try. Great, great, go for <laughs> it, it. It's a little, for those that can't see it visually, it's a little bit complex. Yeah. I, I hope my description will give you a sense of it. It's it's a photo photographic collage and it's put together on a wooden photo frame. The outside is a circle, it's a painted black. And then within the circle are four, black lined frames for the photos and starting up in the upper right my right right hand corner anyway is a, is a photo of a man named chief don steakins he's a the chief of the nohegan tribe and it's a little bit harder to see the details i think it looks like a blue gray shirt he has a traditional headpiece on with beaded around his forehead with uh red bristles sticking up from it he's wearing sunglasses and he has some sort of a necklace but i can't see it well from here right down below him is an outdoor picture of a farm pond with geese not geese i'm sorry ducks on it and a girl with long brown hair standing there watching the geese then over to the left of her is a vertical image with a black horse and a teenager. The teenager is right up close to the horse with his right hand over the horse's neck. He's wearing a black shirt and he's looking off over the back of the horse. And his left hand is holding the rein and a riding helmet. And then up above him, it's a horizontal frame. It's a red background and on it is a black image, well, which is actually a bear skin. And around the bear skin is an orange, which is uh, an accumulation of, of ribbons 
put there uh, to honor the native children in particular who were lost during the times of when they were forced to go to boarding homes. And so this is intending to be a, a healing piece uh, for them. In the middle, it's a small ring, small, much smaller ring in the middle, which is actually made the top of a canning jar rim. <laughs> and I painted it black so it would fit the rest. And and from this distance, you won't see the image, but I'll just describe to you. Uh, it's a woman wearing the type of outfit that a woman in the Abnaki nation in the 1830s probably would have wore, which is a, a cream-colored full blouse with long sleeves, a wrap wool skirt, and she's carrying a variety of baskets because that would have been what she was doing as a craft and as a way to bring in money for her family. Hanging down below it is a white leather strand and from it are hanging uh, black hooves of a deer with beads above them. And I think that describes it pretty well. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kate, for doing that and for getting us all those details. So as you just met, um, we are here with four artists from Mass. They all submitted pieces from Mass, which you just experienced. Um, so we are here with Paul Betts, with Dominic Gabrielson Love, with Kate Adams, and with David Roy, um, and with me and Heidi. Heidi, any comments before we get into our first question? Anything you'd like to start with? Um, just this sort of, this is a reflective, you know, sort of a, where were you when things started with masks? Where are you now? And then, you know, what suggestions do you have for any other disabled artists or people in the community? So that's the flow of the conversation. And um, the artists will introduce themselves a little more as they open with the questions. And other than that, um, yeah, that, I think that's, that's it. I'm really excited. And uh, who, who's gonna start? <laughs> Let's go, let's go in the same order we just did. So yeah. Paul, Paul, will you share with us the question? First of all, um, would you like me to describe your setting or would you like to do a verbal description of yourself? I can do it totally. Um, so Paul Betts is sitting in a living room in his wheelchair and there is a uh, kind of contraption coming off the back of the wheelchair near his mouth. Paul is wearing a gray green um, looks like long sleeve shirt, glasses. Paul's arms are at his sides in the back. There's light coming in from the windows and gray curtains um, and a bookshelf over one of Paul's shoulders. And I know if I know Paul often we're going to see a big great Paul smile because um, Paul <laughs> is Paul is somebody who we've worked with for many, many years now. Um, Paul, thank you for being here with us. And the first question that we'd love for you to explore, and we're going to ask all our artists to explore this, is what prompted you to submit your work, this piece, to Masked? Um, well, my dad was in the This time was I want more clothes that I could have. And when um, I really couldn't get for the friend of mine, I submitted that photo. Mm. Nice. So Paul, as Kat was saying, you've we've worked with you before you had um a piece in the a new exhibition which was the one before this and so when mass came around you had lots more photos it sounded like to to sort of pick from for the theme and this one yeah. I, i'm remembering you're talking about it was when you were with a friend but in your individual artist talk um the mossy crevice photograph was something that was just sort of this thing that caught your attention and you're like i need my camera but you didn't have your camera, so it was the cell phone. Is that, did I get that? I mean, I added a little bit. Well, we, we, um, we are, we are, we, 
Yeah, improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe the other artists can relate to improvisation. I know I can. So, yeah. I bet. I bet. Thanks so much, Paul. And next we'll go to Dominic. Dominic, if you'll just introduce yourself with a brief verbal description and then answer the question, what prompted you to submit to Masked? Uh, sure, uh, I'm Dominic Gabrielson. Um, verbal description, I am um, dark blonde, dirty blonde hair, blue eyes with a beard. I'm sitting on uh, the couch, there's brown pillows behind me. And my windows are covered by uh, kind of brown wooden shades. Um, what got me to, well, the mask exhibition, uh, which I, I may have said before, but it was kind of an accident. I had done a, a series of paintings, including boxes uh, and uh, panels uh, for my family and uh, several painted masks uh, for them and children. You know, my, many of my cousins have one or two or three children. And uh, because of COVID, I was unable to deliver them. And this led to me having a sort of pile of painted masks around <laughs> <laughs> and um, kind of seemed to fit with the theme of the, uh, the exhibition. And uh, I was, you know, then brought in touch with uh, Heidi, and I think at the time, who, who was helping you at the time, Heidi? Um, there was the, a jury, there was a, a jury of people, and so Kat and Katie, there's a number of us behind the scenes, yeah. Okay, yep, and then you had a, a person that was always on with us as well. Oh. Oh, it, I think it was an maybe. intern. Mm hmm Was it Alyssa? I, yeah, it was Alyssa, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And uh, that's just, that's what brought me to the to the show. Bit of happenstance and circumstance. So far, we've got improvisation, happenstance, and circumstance. <laughs> I love it. All right. <laughs> David Roy, would you introduce yourself, do a verbal description, and then tell us what brought you to Mass and what prompted you to submit your work? Of course. Uh, I'm David Roy. Uh, I have blonde hair that's parted in the middle, blue eyes. I'm wearing a gray shirt with a white blue white white blue and gray flannel and my background is various uh my if my own my own artwork is various art pieces um that'll take a while to describe <laughs> each one but there's, there's a lot of them um and then what prompted me to go into uh mass was actually i did a collage class during covid just out of the whim and i enjoyed it and someone who i used to work with like shared the open call for artists uh was that you posted for mass and i was just like oh i have this collage i just made it was the first collage i made after the class and i just submitted it and it happened to get accepted and i was like oh well i guess that happens and now a year <laughs> later all of, all of this stuff have happened that we'll talk about great thanks so much david and kate adams if you would <laughs> introduce yourself into a verbal description and then tell us what prompted you to submit to masked all right well well i'm an elder with moonlight hair which is long and pulled back in the back but i got a big foot lock long lock of it coming over my shoulder uh so my skin is pretty much white i'm wearing a burgundy blouse and i'm sitting on a dark brown couch behind me is the wall which is uh knotty pine boards of my cabin and you partly can see some of the red, yellow, black, white, whoops, that way, <laughs> fringe of a prayer shawl that's hanging on the wall. It was given to me by a good friend. So uh, that's me. And I, I was rather a last minute because I happened to see it in one of those flyers that comes in your mailbox, I think. And it said the mast exhibition. And before COVID, I hadn't been very involved with Facebook or social media, but with COVID, that was a way to kind of at least reach out in some way. 
And there were so much negative images and words on a lot of Facebook. And I wanted to be a part of trying to put positive images out. I love taking photos of nature and animals and creation and people in a natural realm. And, and I've shared those before. And so I was making the effort to put them out on local Facebook sites, but I wanted to find more of a way to share my photography. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh, so check this out. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't have a lot of time. I think it was like two weeks before the deadline. And, uh, but I, I pressed through, there were some challenges with doing it, especially with the piece, as you see, that was a little bit more complicated than just posting one of my photographs. But it was, uh, it's been a very much of a growing learning experience, which I'll get to share more of later in the conversation. So I'm very glad I saw that. <laughs> mm. Now I know that there is such a thing as Inclusive Arts Council. Mm, right. Wonderful. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Heidi, but I just wanted to note, so Paul has been working with us for several ex exhibitions, but um, Dominic and David and Kate are all brand new, um, and this exhibition is what brought our relationship with them. So I have major gratitude for that, for reconnecting us with Paul and for bringing these three phenomenal artists into our creative community. Heidi, do you want to go on and move on to the next prompt? Yeah, I will. And I, um, I just have a big smile on my face. So um, I'm really excited for what will unfold from improvisation and happenstance to why not submit this first piece I did after a class to maybe last minute but I'll persevere kind of things. Um, mm. Yeah, just really, really grateful for all of that. So our next sort of open ended question is, you know, when did the call to artists go out? I think that was, this is the behind the scenes to the question, but um, September of 2019, 2020, no, 2020, 2021. I think we first announced it in April and then it officially went out August and September of 2021, I think. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that detail because um, that was a while ago. And so our question now is, what does masked, air quotes masked, mean to you today? And we have some subsections of that if it's helpful, but why don't we start with a wide open? What does mask mean to you today? And um, we'll just invite the artist to respond kind of as you feel moved. Yeah, uh, I can start. Um, mass sort of gave me like a new confidence in myself. Like my life has changed a lot since Mass had started. Like a year ago, I didn't really pursue art and I was back at in Vermont. Since then, I'm actively pursuing art. I'm selling posters of my own art and I'm living in New York City. So I think Max sort of gave me, like it just gave me the confidence to go out and try more. And so I guess like mass in a way means to me like that new that, that new life to me. So mass is like always gonna be like a very like important part of my life. Mm. Thank you, David. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. That's really yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. And David, like, so the other thing is David and Kate, they did art their own artist talks at the beginning of the series and Dominic and Paul have done it later. And so I had the privilege of interviewing David and I remember, you know, it was new and you were still figuring out, you know, do I call myself an artist? What are those words? You know, how do I define myself? And to see the evolution that's happened is very major. And so grateful that we could be a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyone else yeah. want to respond to the open-ended and we'll kind of follow up with details like artist identity, disability identity, process, that sort of thing if needed, but who's, who's next? Great, Paul. Yeah, go for it, Paul. Because I 
with our lives. Don't the other eyes talk. Thanks so much, Paul. I, the volume for me was fading in and out, but what I was um, hearing from that is that, um, I'm gonna summarize a little bit. Um, when we did your individual artist talk, you shared that video because people are always asking you how, do you, how do you do photography? Like, how do you do it? You're in a wheelchair and you created a video um, that includes your photography and also pictures of you taking pictures. Yeah in response, which is in your individual artist talk. And I imagine one of the tech magicians will put it in the comments. Um, but, but, and also the, through the, the um, journey isn't your word, but through your photography pr practice, um, what masks means to you is that you can do the photography independently. That's something that you never thought or other people may not have thought you could do, but you, have this setup where you push the buttons and you do the viewing and um, with some help, but the photography is your art and your perspective. Did, did I catch all the main points? Yeah. And, and Paul, I remember from other hats of Inclusive Arts Vermont, some of those early, you know, before you had your new camera and the contraption and I say contraption, maybe that's just the technology setup. Um, it was really, really cool um, for, you know, just in hindsight, if you will, that there was lots of possibilities, even though we didn't know exactly what they were yet. And here you are yeah. with your website and all the photographs and um, yeah. yeah. Anything else? I, I want to make sure that I didn't miss something because I, I think the volume early on in what you were talking, I didn't quite catch all of that, but. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I would desire, um, I I I am I I Mm. Mm. Yeah. I, I, I have a pretty season to 
Yeah. Yeah, you were um, mentioning the van not working and how that logistic has impacted yeah. photography. But before that, you said something, Paul, um, that you, without mask, you don't think you'd be where you are with photography today. No, it did. I, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I would be where I am with photography because being all being all that, being all that, being all that, being being all that, being Paul, we know it. Yeah. Paul's saying people are looking at the art, but they're not buying it yet. But <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if yeah. other artists can relate to that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much, Paul. Um, yeah. so glad to have that. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to, to say to Paul that I really, I really like that piece, Paul. I mean, it shows that you truly do have an artist's eye. Of all of what was there that you picked out and captured a glimpse to share with other people. And I'm glad you did. It's a very, for me, it's a very peaceful image. And uh, I like it very much. So thank you. Hey, well. hey, would you like to continue and share a bit about yours? And then we'll go to Dominic. Does that work? Mm, okay. Great. Yeah. What was the question again? <laughs> so it's it's so you talked first about what oh. prompted what what prompted mm -hmm. you to submit your work, but this is what does mask mean to you today? How has that evolved over the time? Oh, all right. Of course, it's the name of the exhibition, which introduced me to the Inclusive Arts Council and to the opportunity to exhibit this in several locations couple of them close enough to me that I was able to go to the receptions, which was a big step for me to step out and say, yes, I am an artist with my photography. And it's actually on a wall where it's being shared with other people. And to be able to go and hear people's questions and comments and then the conversations uh, that came from that, uh, was very enriching for me. Um, and just yesterday, I actually went to Dartmouth College, Dartmouth Hitchcock Hospital, 
where it currently is is on a wall, a long wall <laughs> in the main area of the open. It's really in a very good location. And I have a friend who comes to be blessed by my horses who actually works in the cancer, the children's cancer unit there. So we met briefly and she told me how when she's bringing a patient, she chooses that hallway to be able to show them, you know, and she was, had a patient with her, I think in a wheelchair when she saw it and she, she knew that that was my photo collage. So she says, stop, stop, I gotta take a picture. Um, so, so to know that it's blessing other people is uh, very heart, heartwarming for me. And the, the masked word is another whole level of it, okay? The masked word is that because my piece, I didn't really explain it, that the title is The Hidden Grandmother. And because I qualify for three of the categories of disabled, complex PTSD and ADH difference, because I don't use the word disorder, we just, we're different. Um, and that I'm indigenous, I had to choose what to do. And I was only beginning to be more aware of my Abenaki ancestry. And for me, it was very important for me to remove the masks that my family has had to wear as indigenous people in this part of the world. Because a couple centuries before, there was a lot of not good things happening. And uh, my grandmother purposely hid her identity and therefore my grandfather's identity because she knew of the racism um, that would come against him if he was considered Abnaki. So it was a long journey for me to finally find the truth that I suspected. And not all of my family even knows that I've done this. During this, my sister did say to me, when I told her that it was on exhibit, she says, well, how do you know that we're a Benneke? So I had a chance to tell her that journey. And then my daughter has been even more like, uh, when she'd see me dressed to go to a gathering where I'm using wearing some traditional regalia. She's like, no, I don't want to go with you. <laughs> um, but I, in the last month when I was visiting them and I got to go out to lunch with her and my grandson, she asked me. So I got to tell her also the story of how I came to this awareness and that uh, I hoped that my my piece is sort of a telling of my story, but also a telling a story of some of the family behind me that had to hide their stories. So that's mm -hmm. significant. And this recording gives me another means. So I've also learned a lot more about social media and Zooms. So that gives me even more opportunities. So I will have this even as a means that I could go put on my personal Facebook. I could send to other family and say, I hope you'll watch this and join me in honoring our family's ancestors. Mm. Thank you so, so much, Kate. Um, may I reflect something back? Mm -hmm. Just of all that you said, and we've had many conversations. You know. <laughs> yes, <we have. laughs> um, so if I am misunderstanding something, I trust you'll kind of, but one of the first things you said um, just now was that what is mass mean to you today was about um, claiming your identity as an artist and, you know, the sort of artistic identity. And then, you know, the theme mask to the, the reasons we put that out was that many people with disabilities um, invisible disabilities have these, you know, marginalized groups. And so that intersectionality for you, and again, this is where I, I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding, but between your 
Abenaki ancestry and your disability, the invisible disabilities, there was a couple choice points of where do you put the art there from these hidden things that people mask, you know, put under veils and stuff. And so with that, um, the process of creating the art, there was some unmasking for you and then for your family through having art on the walls and putting that out into the world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, the and, and it is also helped me become more uh, feel like an accepted member of some of the Abenaki communities, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in a way, some that responded to me, it's like, wow, I'm telling their story, you know, and I'm getting to share it in a public way mm -hmm. that is respectful. And uh, so the blessings are flowing. Well, thank you. And I know we want to get to Dominic. I'm just going to put mm -hmm. on this sort of organization hat for a moment, which is part of, um, I'm going to say if that's okay to can get a thumbs up to interject something here. Kat, are we getting thumbs up? I, I think I mean, it, it okay. seems fine. It seems fine. <laughs> just that part of the exhibitions in general um, are a way to bring um, awareness about access and inclusion through the arts for many things. You know, <laughs> People with disabilities are often, um, you know, stories aren't necessarily told or disabled voices. And so Inclusive Arts Vermont does that through art and, you know, the ongoing exhibitions thing. So the masked one, when it started, you know, it has a theme of its own and life of its own. And um, what I'm really hearing from you, Kate, is that multiple identities um, you were able to look at and share um, in this art and it keeps mm -hmm, it Mm -hmm. and, Be and I don't because the outdoor photography and the nature are all part of my healing growing journey for someone healing through PTSD and through learning healthier life skills to deal with my very creative but active energetic executive lack of functioning brain <laughs> but yeah. to be able to celebrate to be able to focus on the gifts part I'd not feel so weighed down by my own interpretation or the interpretation of the society around me for how I'm labeled. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> and Dominic, how about for you? What does masks mean to you today? Um, well, masks has come to mean a lot more than the, the exhibition. It's more about the people at this point um and the small community that we have of, of open-minded individuals and as many meetings as i can attend it's uh, probably my favorite part of uh my routine on the week Aww. as simple as it is that we all just talk for an hour or so um i also was not i mean i made art before masks obviously that's why it's in the show i hadn't made art for a decade really much uh, versus every day for years. And um, since uh, I've been in the exhibition participant, taking my my small part, I've uh, been inspired to do more work, to get more shows. Uh, I found it to be quite easy uh, to get into shows much easier than I thought, I suppose, possibly part of its age, uh, a bit of its reputation. Um, but um, yeah, so I mean, the transformation is a little bit um, into being more into living living arts and making them again I, I suppose yeah. Yeah. but again I, I'd say it has gone past the exhibition into, into the people who I'm thankful to be able to have the opportunity to share uh, time and, and thoughts with mm. well, thanks Dominic mm -hmm. um, so much. I I would like to just uh, something from the individual artists talk about from our other conversations where um, one of the, the things for Dominic's piece is that we have a tactile element um, where Dominic shared an extra mask so that people could actually touch it, you know, and then um, we've had tours and, you know, people are doing selfies in front of the Dominic's piece and because the masks are so inviting and when we um, did the artist talk with you, Dominic, you said it, that the, that art was always meant to be played with and to be engaged with. So that it didn't go to your family because of COVID, 
and then now it's on walls and with school children and um, in other ways, it's kind of having a different life of um, being played with and interacted with and you know, having conversations start around different things. Um, so not what was intended necessarily, but um, I guess an evolution of its own maybe. And I just, I wanted to, to bring that up into the conversation here as well, just because um, you were so, um, well, my, my sense is that you were like, yes, play with this. <laughs> like you're, um, the, the most important thing about being an artist is the love of art, <laughs> you know, it's like that. And you're now talking about people and that sort of the relational element with the art, if that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Where, where, where can you draw from an endless pool of inspiration it's going to, going to be love and compassion mm. and I absolutely think that um, yeah I wanted people to be able to play with the masks I mean they're meant for, for half of them for children almost so you know almost half of them I'm glad that people got something tactile yeah. um, I love to you know one of the things that we try to do is really think expansively about who gets to experience art, you know, and we're thinking about it mostly with a disability lens, but I think also, Dominic, you know, we, I love that you said, no, these were, many of them were made for children, and I think a lot of times there are all these barriers to art that exist, and, and, you know, a lot of people determining who gets to access art, and I think I love that in so many ways, we're trying to break those down. And I know that we've had schools go see this exhibit, experience this exhibit, interact with this exhibit, make masks inspired by this exhibit, inspired by your piece. And so I think it really has been able to broaden it both with folks with disabilities accessing art, folks of all ages accessing art, rural folks around the state accessing art. And so um, gratitude to all of you for just that expansiveness that's, mm -hmm. that's happened because of this exhibit. Yeah. Great. Okay. So just in the matter of time, because we're going to be doing a dynamo, I'm kind of going to give these next three questions as a whole and you choose mm -hmm. what speaks to you. Um, so the questions are, you know, and some of you, you've already touched on some of these, but think about your work with mass and your experience with mass and just the past year of yourself as an artist. How has it impacted your artistic identity or process, your sense of disability or connections and opportunities? And you don't have to speak to all of those, all right. speak to one or more, um, but just to go around briefly and kind of think about artistic identity, sense of disability, connections and opportunities, whichever one of those resonate to you. And whoever would like to start, go for it. David, yeah, it looks like you're ready. I can, I can start. Um, yeah, I feel like math, in a sense, gave me my own sense of identity because math came in a very like pivotal time in my life. I was in the last year of college. I was about to go into what my life is now, like an adult life. And so math was very much the, it was my like step into my new life where I found out this new part of me that I've never did. Like I did sports growing up. I never thought I would be an artist. I did that one class. I was the only art class I've ever done. And so I guess it sort of mass created my artist identity because I didn't really have an identity in art before mass. And so in a sense, it, that definitely created my art identity. Uh, with my disability identity, I've always sort of been in very upfront about my disability. Uh, I'm always having, I'm always usually the only one with a uh, disability. Like I'm the only one in my family, most of my schools. And so, Mass was a way for me to connect to people who have a disability just like me in a way that I don't really get to connect with many people. And so I think disability has always been a, a big sin for me, it's always been an identity piece for me, but Mass has helped me explore it in more ways than I thought. And that led into like opportunities of being in the exhibit and just the connections I've built through inclusive arts has been very rewarding. Like my life has gone through so much change in the last year and mass has a huge part of that. And I could not like, I would not be where I was if it wasn't for mass. Like I already have like a wall of like all my art. And then I have like, I went to some of the mass exhibits and so I collected some of the pamphlets to put on my wall too. So mass is just like, I will always be thankful for mass. And it made like who the artist I am today, so. Mm. 
we will always be thankful for you, David. <laughs> I know that. Um, that's beautiful. Thank you for that reflection. Um, and yeah, you know, I, it's, it's, I think that this time is a really evolving time for a lot of folks. And so we're so glad mm -hmm. to have been part of that process for you and that this exhibit and the experience of the exhibit was that. Any other thoughts? Who else would like to share? And I'm going to add into that if there's a an artist who said something that inspires you to respond to that yeah. sort of kind of open ended um, at this point, and we will we will wrap up with the suggestions in, in just a yeah. few. Yeah. I, I will just mention that I, I really, you know, you mentioned the people and the people I've met through this, and um, the one that I've interacted the most with with this group is is Heidi and we've had some very interesting conversations discussions different perspectives uh and she's always saying you know it's it's a growing and a learning process and uh I, I definitely feel less encumbered by what I perceived as negatives about some of these labels and I I know that when the children would come to my horse program and when I I always know when someone's ADH <laughs> I have two horses that are ADH they connect with those kids so phenomenally and I, I I can say to them but I wasn't always saying it to myself um sometimes they would say it almost in shame when they would tell me oh yeah I'm one of those mm -hmm. And I would say, give me a high five, because I am too, referring to ADH. I say, I know, let me tell you what I know about you. I also know that you are brilliant, and that you are curious, and you are innovative. You're also very intuitive. You have a good sense with animals, creation, even people. Um, but you get bored very easily. You do not <laughs> like being bored. Okay, you can have a dramatic reaction to that. You can either just numb out or you can fight back. I see that in my horse, Houdini Hawkster, for sure. Um, and I said, but there are some things that are hard for you that are also frustrating for other people. But we can ask for help for those because when I was trying to figure out, I wasn't sure I could pull this all together. There were so many complexities, but Heidi would just say, well, that's okay. We know you're trying. You could get it to us on Monday. I won't even go through all the things I had to go through to even make get all the way through those steps. But it also fits with what I tell the children that come here. So I acknowledge there's a limitation, but it doesn't need to totally stymie us and drown us. We can get help. We can learn new skills. We can get a partner that can kind of take care of that part i said but so the the issue sometimes is a focus and you being able to focus in the way other people want you to do and sometimes that's hard for you to do but when there's something that's really important to you you will focus and you will persist long after other people would have quit okay and I know that's true for me with my horse program because a lot of people just say you're a crazy horse lady. Why are you putting so much of your effort into this? You, uh, yourself, whatever. Okay. And and I knew that what I'm doing with the horse program is important, and I'm glad I've persisted with it because I'm being able to see the fruit in other people's lives. That what I've grown through, I can offer them hope and encouragement. And I'm only realizing now as I'm talking about it, wow, that is that part of me that got me through to even get my entry to you to be considered. So thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's mutual. And, you know, again, I'll put the Inclusive Rights Vermont kind of lens on it, which is, um, the world, ha there's people, there's barriers for people with disabilities in the world. And sometimes there's a little healthy dose of, well, who says this timeline, you know, like at some point there needs to be a deadline, but access 
is about creativity and we build in wiggle room for our own capacity and um, yeah, so there's some flexibility within that. And um, I think Inclusive Arts Vermont, my hope is that we're a little bit different than a traditional um, organization that just sees the rules without seeing people um, because you know, we talk about humans first, so yeah. And I remember being at the Saxons River that how a person there spoke about how it really kind of helped cause them to stop and relook at even technical things like at what height do you put a piece of art on the wall and oh realizing there's not a handicapped parking sign out in front it's way down the road so there's ripple effects in many many ways there that's a great point and so you know it's both with the individual artists but it also is with communities and saxon's river for instance there are now there's now a permanent accessible parking spot right outside of their facility they advocated to the town to make one because of this exhibit and because the work we were doing around inclusive practices and so we're so grateful for the artists but also for the venues we get to work with who are making those changes and who are learning so the thank you for bringing that up kate that's great yeah yeah. Dominic or Paul, did you want to share just anything about how it's impacted your artistic identity or sense of disability or connections? Yeah, yeah go ahead, Paul. Uh, well, one thing that I noticed is um, by me, now, um, it, it, it made me, um, made me more, more self, more, made me more self aware of why, of why I'm pretty out for the COVID to see mm. because everybody always always mm. reading their compliments out where you yeah it makes you more self-aware of what you're putting out for the public yeah yeah nice yeah, it's interesting because this, you know, a lot of our artist talks, we had a lot of our artists say, you know, I, I think the majority of our artists said not, and this is not, you know, everybody, but said that they make art for themselves, you know, they make art because they're inspired and in that creative creative process, but an exhibition by nature is a reciprocal process between the folks who are experiencing yeah. art and the artists. And so, you know, it it's putting that art out there into the world. And so there's a great, you know, an increased awareness of that reciprocity between artistic audiences and creators. And so, yeah. Dominic, I know um, you, it's always okay to pass, but we're just gonna invite you in. And um, also we might skip into the, the final question while you're still here um, before you yeah. have to out. So, um, Kat, if you want to remind. Of yeah, the official perfect. Questions. So, Dominic, if you, what we'll do is kind of have you speak to those questions if you want, but then also, because we know you have to head out, if there's anything else. So, Dominic, you've got a hefty thing. How has this impacted artistic identity or process, a sense of disability, connections or opportunities, any or all of those? What suggestions might you offer? to disabled artists in the audience or anything else you want folks to know. So kind of this is your wrap up, Dominic, like okay. share with us whatever from that you would like. Okay, so um, masked, how has it affected my artist identity or process? Um, I think that um, at least during the time that the exhibition has been going on, um, I've uh, returned to a sense of my own artist identity and realized that there are many people uh, far more than I realized uh, would have 
numbering over 100 that think of me as an artist and have wondered where my artwork is and why it wasn't available or why I haven't been making gifts of art over the last few years. And mm. that gave me some sense of, um, some sense of it, some sense of um, inspiration. No, no pride at all, no ego, nothing I always saw as troubling signs, just um, a small comfort and, uh, you know, a reason to make some more things to give away and find homes for. Aww. So I suppose that's part of how it's helped my identity. Yeah. Um, I would add that, um, well, I'll get into some of the connections, but I've also realized looking at my art from across, I don't know, 30 something years, 40 if I looked further, um, I've seen paintings that, uh, I've made that I couldn't even believe I made. And I realized I, I taught myself how to paint them in that day that were like a mix of a, a Renaissance painting and um, another artist I can't remember. And I've seen uh, color combinations that I, I wouldn't even think or dare to do nowadays that I've, I've done very simply. And I found architectural renderings hanging on my parents' walls and I, the painting of shoes that was timeless that I somehow made and all these just completely different, completely different things. I've never had a, you know, I've always loved to draw and I've always loved to, uh, to explore painting, but I hadn't really realized that for everything from graphic design to video game design to digital art to sculpture, I mean, I've, I don't have a particular style. And uh, though I can do almost any style, I guess it's a skill and maybe it's a rare skill, but, um, so I'm glad of that. And it reminds me, and so I'm saying as an, as an identity, I don't have a particular style. Um, and the same with martial arts when I was 18, I decided, you know, just, I would study four or five more styles of martial arts, which is something you guys probably don't know about. <laughs> but at one point I just realized that the greatest form of martial arts is just to be ready mm -hmm. and have a, a serenity of mind and uh, have absolutely no style because no style can prepare you for what can happen. So I, th those hard to say, but that's my best mm -hmm. uh, attempt at it. And then yeah. um, sense of disability. Well, it's uh, it's been reinforcing um, that I don't have to be a handicapped. I mean, for instance, I'm very exhausted today in, in the last couple of days, but uh, with the healthy diet and some exercise, I will get to this pile of work that I have all these paints for. Um, and I've done my drawings. So, I mean, um, there's a few things. Also, it's uh, it's not necessarily me alone, but I've been part of a community of people with various degrees of disability, including, including other people with severe Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to see us all persevere um, is inspiring. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know how to say it, but uh, it's, very, more, it's more valuable to me than I could possibly say to you. It's, in fact, I wouldn't change it for not having gotten sick almost uh, to see some of the persevering spirit is, I might have, I might have missed it had I not uh, been able to see it firsthand. Um, and I, and that, would, that would have been quite a loss. And I, mm. I, I really don't have a better way of saying that. Um, how has it facilitated connections or opportunities? Well, and I might add as well, uh, great inspiration has come from all this. Um, well, uh, within this group, the connections are all uh, boundless. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no limitation. We haven't all met in person, if, if any of us have, I don't know. I haven't been to these exhibits mostly because of COVID and then placement where I was located. But um, being in the shows has definitely inspired me to find other shows, uh, which mm -hmm. have maybe more found me. Um, to take on those opportunities with less fear or trepidation, um, more willing to, to take on even art making and not so worried or precious about the end product, but you know, I'll get there in this or the next piece, you know. Um, 
but I mean, I think that question also has to do with uh, more tangible connections than simply an internal dialogue. So I don't think a person could say enough uh, what it is to have their work shown from a place of uh, solitude and sometimes desperation when you're sick and to suddenly be propelled into any form of show, let alone given a community of artists of like mind to speak to. Uh, but that in and of itself is the greatest value in this journey and experience for me. So that has opened my mind to other opportunities I would not have considered. I wouldn't have considered taking on any of the shows, that I'm even co-hosting shows. I wouldn't even consider even talking about them, even picking up a paintbrush to look at them. What suggestions might you offer to disabled artists, artists in the audience, anything else? Uh, I'm not, you know, full of suggestions, but I mean, I'm sure we've all self arrived at the same conclusions that it's your work and your time you put in derived from your inspiration gives us an opportunity to share a moment. A person, most of the people that see our artwork, they'll never be in the moment that we felt inspired to, to create it. However, we can bring them to that moment through our artwork and through a dialogue at times as well. This is one of the greatest gifts of, of making of any kind of, of writing, of drawing, of painting, of film, fashion, sculpture, design, performance art, anything. We bring up, we bring some, we carry something, we share something like, like a film, so to speak, is a very clear example. Um, also that, you know, whatever it is, I've found, and I don't know if I'm saying this necessarily to you or just with you, um, that a therapy that's very valuable for me is my creating of things, creating of images, folding paper. It's just too uh -huh. nice little things. Uh, but they, you know, I'm getting something out. I may not feel well on that day, yeah. but I will have made something. And um, people don't see into our disability. I think it's nearly impossible for most people to see into a disability. Um, sometimes the more educated they are, the harder it is for them to actually understand instead of know what's wrong, but not actually to understand what it's like. There's mm. a very big difference. And um, as people with any form of uh, health concerns, mental, physical, anything, emotional, I guess you could say is a third wheel on that, uh, or spiritual, you know, <laughs> as people experience it, there may be a way that we can show people what we see, uh, how we feel, uh, also that we're not so different from other people. Um, it doesn't make us less or necessarily more, you know, um, but I have found uh, in a way of a blessing that disability can give us um, an added strength, uh, sensitivity to others. Coming from a place of suffering, I may, I've learned to take more consideration for others. I've appreciated my conversations more when I have the opportunity to be outside and to have them with somebody. Um, you know, I, I think that's, so perhaps some of that sensitivity that comes from a bit of physical or mental suffering gives us an insight, can give us an extra intuition to connect with the subjects that we try to create art with and the people that we speak to. Uh, mm -hmm. I have noticed that, and I've started to notice that in many people who have uh, chronic illnesses, uh, that they tend to be given a, an extra sense of compassion and a deeper insight into human emotion about the people around them, and they connect with people very deeply and in, in a much more effortless fashion. <coughs> and sometimes we appreciate, we appreciate more of the connection. So yeah. I don't know if that's exactly something that's I can offer, yeah. but it's something I've, I've witnessed. Thank you so much for that, Dominic. Yeah, that's a powerful reflection. Um, thank you. And thank you for being part of this and sharing the compassion and receiving compassion, being open to receiving it. And um, we're glad that this has been an inspiring experience for you and knowing you has been an inspiring experience for us. So um, wonderful. I know it's 2.30 and I know you had to go by 2.30. Um, thank, yeah, thank you for being here. And then for our other artists, we're going to go around and just um, 
kind of the the final prompt is what suggestion might you offer disabled artists in the audience or anything else that you'd like to share yeah thank you guys I'm really loud, uh, thanks dominic go ahead paul yeah for I know I know for myself. I I only have to keep from the my mind to I have to have a to go Thanks, Paul, for adding a little bit more about some of your challenges. And um, and I just heard you say at the end there, you'll figure it out, you know, that sort of sense yeah. of flexibility, adaptability, yeah. perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, I think probably other artists and other disabled artists might relate a little bit to perseverance and also frustration, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> sometimes things are challenging. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I was about to, I was about to say like, I relate very much to the perseverance and like that's very much like in tune with what my like suggestion was going to be to like artists and all that is that uh, if you show any interest in anything, have the courage to try it at least once. Cause you just never know what's going to happen and that's sort of what led me to math it was just like hey let me try let me just try this and see what happens and it led to this whole different path so i think just not just disability artists or artists but just like people in general as we live life is just if you show interest in something if something generally interests you have the courage and bravery to try at least once 
because if you try it and you don't like it, then all right, you try it, you can say you try instead of holding on to like, what if I did that? And I'm happy that I did the math because I probably would have gone to my wife and like, what if I did the math value? Like what would have happened? And now I got to see what happened. So I think that would have been like, that's my suggestion to just anyone is if you show interest, just try at least once to see what happens. Hmm. And and I I would just comment, uh, David, because I I uh, listened to your your first artist talk, and I just you you just express so much more confidence. Uh, I can't really say, <laughs> can't even really. It, it's very very tangible, and and it feels like there's even a joy that. There's something more that comes from within you because you did take this risk. And uh, it. thank you. Yeah. And then you took the risk to be willing to be interviewed. And that was, I know for me, all that was really <laughs> scary at first. Uh, you're obviously was. becoming more comfortable with that. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to have to look up your art, more of what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> Yeah, and and I think you know, I, and I'll let I'll go back to just or actually I won't say David anything else you wanted to share too about suggestions. Those are beautiful suggestions, and I think especially in this time when a lot of folks have not felt, you know, it's it's a hard time to be inspired right now in some ways. But I think sometimes we get so caught up in final product in what you know what if I mess up, but just I I think what you're saying is just play and play with that creativity and allow yourself, if, if there's an inkling of interest, allow yourself to play and go into those creative spaces because who knows what will come with it, whether it's just a therapeutic creative process or whether it's a total shift in life, you know, um, allowing yourself to play and explore um, and trying to kind of remove some of that fear from it, I think is, is, is huge and really important right now in the world. Mm -hmm. I think like what I love about art is like the final product is great and everything like I love like with my exhibit and want like Wanda, I love how it came out but my favorite part of it was the actual like, creating process of it mm -hmm. and it's like it's a good reminder to me as like someone who's just living their life and I'm about to turn 24 I'm about to have my first birthday in the city like someone who's just going through a lot in life it's reminded that to enjoy the journey that's going through, don't always think about the destination. Because I feel like we all get stuck with, like, especially my age, people always wondering, like, what's your future going to be like? What's your career? What's your family going to be like? And you're going to get married, all that. Like, everyone's always thinking about the final product. And what I have really done for me is just remind me that, like, it's the journey that I enjoy. So, like, the final product could be great too, but don't forget to also enjoy the process to it because that will just make the final product even better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks, David. Yeah. Nice. Kate, any final thoughts, any suggestions or final thoughts that you'd um, like to share? Yes, I will. I, uh, I'm not sure that came directly as a result of the mask, though, though the mask giving me the confidence that I put that together and got it in helped me respond to a request from a local gallery who learned about my Abnaki story and said, well, I would love to have a display of Abnaki traditions. And she knew also I'd been to South Dakota and have many images from my Lakota friends. And so fortunately she gave me a year to do it, which is a good thing. Um, and so last spring I, d I had an exhibit called Traditions of Abenaki and Lakota people. And it was a challenge pulling it together. I didn't have a lot of money. I couldn't afford what I want is really quality matting and frame that enhances the image, not to just put it into any old thing. And I had to make do with what I had and what I could find at Hobby Lobby when it was 50% off. <laughs> but I got it together and it was just a really nice display. And it was the first. They hosted their first open event that they've had since COVID and for, for me to talk and share. And she said, I'm not sure if we'll have very many people, you know, but counting all of us, we ended up with 17 people there. Mm. And, and I got 
I, so I get I had that opportunity to share the stories that were behind the images. Did I sell any? No. <laughs> but I'm I'm not past believing that I have a value that I should financially be able to gain from my art. Uh, at this point, I, I'm just very content and grateful to have the opportunities and keep working on improving my skill set. And mm -hmm. I also feel that what the whole COVID thing has done helped me become more aware of much more online stuff. Right now, I don't have a website yet, but I am getting very intentional and I'm asking some people have offered to help me because I know that would help if I could say to people, you could go look at this. Um, but I think because there's so many changes in the world because of COVID and businesses that couldn't stay functioning in the COVID world very well, many of them have moved to becoming online businesses. And I think that that is an area where there's an opportunity for us as artists to be able to promote our artwork, you know, across the country, across the world. Uh, mm -hmm. So I still got to keep working on the tech skill. Level. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? This is Heidi. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> um, I think at this point we're winding down and um, Kat, is there any, any other questions or other wrap up? I mean, thank you so much to all of you for your, yes. your time, your presence, your um, authenticity, your creativity. And um, I am looking forward to whatever's next. I'll, there's a few things with MAST, but um, as we wind down today, Kat, anything from your perspective that we've missed or we want to include? Just, it's been such a beautiful experience to witness all of you in as your artistic selves, as the humans you are. Um, and, and I think there's such a generosity of spirit from all of you and what you've given each other as a, an artistic community, what you've shared with us as an organization and what you've shared with the folks who have been able to engage with your art, whether it's through these talks or through um, folks who are seeing and experiencing the art on the walls. So um, it's just a real immense joy and honor to share a space with you um, and to know you and to um, to to be part of your community and um, I will forever have gratitude with uh, for for this group of humans yeah thank you for having us like <laughs> I've always wanted just I think we have to thank like Heidi and Kat and everyone who works at Inclusive Art. Like all of yes. this is thanks to all the work that you each of you put in. So I think as artists too, we are very appreciated of all the work you put in behind the scenes. Because that's like we have we put the artwork, but none of it would have been to like put together without the work that <laughs> each one of you put. So just thank you for all the hard work you do. And, and I'll add that too for the galleries. Yeah. You know, it, it yeah. reminded me how much I love used to love just going in galleries and enjoying the art of other people. I mean, I would go into fancy galleries and say, I can't afford to buy anything, mm -hmm. but I could just stand here and look and admire and consider what that's speaking to me. So mm -hmm. I want to thank all the folks that were a part of that. And I'm really looking forward to when we're at the State House. I think it's a time for us to all consider ways that this might be able to have an impact on legislators mm -hmm. and legal and funding and more education opportunities for all of what you're doing. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And stay tuned. We will be inviting artists into planning for the next exhibition. So um <laughs> you know, it's the process, right? <laughs> I'm a forward thinker and um, we value input from people who are doing the art and you know have the lived experience. So um, we're, we're wrap, um, wrapping up, winding down. I wanted to merge those words apparently. 2022 um, as reflective uh, and 2023 is on its way. Not yet, but you know, stay tuned. We, as I say, we know where you live, but we also have your email addresses. <laughs> I think it's, it's part of the 2022, or the text messages. Um, and we will right. um, 
it is a joy and a privilege and a pleasure to be um, able to do this work with you. Um, so yeah, I'm glad it's appreciated, but it's really um, a joy from, from my inside out, yeah. All right. Thank you all think so much, uh, uh, Paul, David, Kate, um, Dominic, who is no longer here, uh, and yeah. Megan, thank you from behind the scenes. Heidi, thank you for being just the artner of my heartner, you know, <laughs> it's been such a joy working with you and um, major gratitude for this community. Yeah. <laughs>